Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Faye, for organizing this wonderful conference every year. And um, thanks to all of you for coming out. I'm talking today about this notion of expanding students' repertoires of linguistic practice. And I'm adding in cultivating transcultural dispositions. Now, that may sound like a bit of jargon, but these are terms we've been using with middle school students. And they kind of laugh at us, but they, before you know it, they're using those terms too. Um, and if I asked you to think about language, what metaphors might come to your mind? Just think for a second, what metaphors come to your mind? So learning language. Learning language is like, or did I just make it a simile? I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. Well, metaphor, metaphor, simile. What comes to your mind when you think about learning language? Learning language is like what? You don't have to tell me. Just think about it for a second. And I would suggest to you that I don't know what you thought about, but I would say that one of the predominant metaphors that we have for thinking about learning language is like filling up a tank or filling up a anything. Something, fill, you, you pour it in, you, it, you, you have a certain amount and it grows, but it's about pouring in um, experience and it somehow grows. Learning two languages, we might envision as filling up two tanks. And in fact, we have uh, discussions in bilingual ed about whether there's just, you have two separate tanks in your head or one, and whether there's any transfer between them. But there is a sense that they should somehow be kept separate and pure, and we should fill, maybe keep in bilingual ed, we might say we want to fill them both up equally, but we do want to keep them separate. Um, I want to suggest the limitations of that metaphor for the ways we think about cultivating language and, and suggest that we really need other metaphors, other ways to drive our thinking, to get out of that filling up the tank metaphor. And you know, probably the most useful one that I've found is the toolbox. Okay. So think about helping students to develop language as cultivating the, their skills in using a wide variety of tools in a toolbox and to use them flexibly, to use them for purposes, to build things, to make things happen, and to select what you need when. You know, you need a hammer sometimes. You don't need a hammer all the time. And that's the hammer <laughs> I propose as the metaphor for what we tend to do in schools. We say, you need a hammer. You need, hammer is the most powerful um, tool, and you need it, and we're going to make sure you cultivate your skills in using the hammer. But that hammer isn't going to help you very much when you have to screw in a light bulb to, uh, or something. I, I'm sorry. I need to, I need to work on my uh, <laughs> metaphors <laughs> when you need to screw in the, put together a table. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. So if we work with this notion of, of um, uh, toolbox or repertoires, repertoires of practice, tools in, the, in that set of repertoires. Um, you know, we can see that the work that the children of immigrants do um, as language and culture brokers is very much about using the tools in their toolbox. And I've been working for uh, more than a decade to study what kids like Estela, who drew herself here in her family portrait, um, do when they use their knowledge, I would define language brokering or translating slash interpreting as using knowledge of, of two languages to speak, read, write, listen, and do things. And they used to say for their families, and I've more and more been realizing it's not just for their families. Kids are contributing to society as a whole, to communities. They're translating and interpreting for teachers, lawyers, doctors, store uh, personal. They're helping their families to be consumers. They're mediating in all kinds of situations between different relationships, different authority structures, sometimes sitting at home reading a variety of texts and explaining what they mean to their parents, sometimes going out in public, sometimes mediating in their own parent-teacher conferences. Um, and I would argue that kids are learning stuff from this. They're learning really valuable skills. Um, and I'm, I'd, I'd name three principle, um, fundamental skills that come from this. Actually, I don't really like the term skills, so I'm calling it dispositions. This notion of being transcultural dispositions as being learning to be open to new circumstances, to new situations, to be attentive, to notice what's going on, to see who might need help with translation and step in to offer it. We saw that continuously with kids. And, to listen closely. You never know when you're going to be expected to translate. Let me see, do I have, um, yeah, oh no. 
I should have shown you the slides of, of a parent-teacher conference from which um, one teacher very carefully parsed the words and gave space for the child to translate, and another teacher spoke for more than 500 words and then said, explain that to your mom. Okay, but so we, when you're in the listening position, you don't know when the person's gonna stop and when you're gonna be expected to step in. So keen observation, attentive listening. What comes along for the ride, I think, is this perspective taking, learning to see the world from the perspectives of different people. And I'll um, say something about that in a second. And then this third notion is flexibility, versatility in um, how you use language. So sometimes kind of talking around a subject because you don't quite want to let people know exactly what uh, was said. Sometimes trying to be very clear and precise and repeat things so that you make sure this was understood by your mother, for example. Um, strategic ambiguity, redundancy, literacy strategy. So this, this is just a taste of some of the things I've seen um, working with child language brokers and talking to them about their experiences. I'll just give you my favorite journal um, entry written back in 2001 by a boy who talks about caddying between a rich woman and, uh, and translating between a rich woman and some field workers who hopped on the cart. Um, am I already... Oh, no. Yeah, there's my timer. Okay. <laughs> um, and he says, well, it felt weird, though, because I didn't feel that Ms. J, the rich woman, didn't, who was kind of cocky and uptight, as he said, didn't really want to talk to him. It made me feel like the guy was thinking of me as a stuck-up rich kid. Of course I'm not. It's like Ms. J's attitude was being shown through my translating. And ever since I read this journal entry way back, I've been thinking about it and thinking, how can we build on this these, this awareness. And talking with Sam, he said, well, you know, so can you s explain how you did it? And he pinned it down to the level of words. He said, well, when I was talking to her, I said, like, nice. And when I was talking to them, I said, like, cheeto, like, cool, you know? <laughs> Differently nuanced words that mean essentially the same thing, but that were appropriate for each audience and that reflected how he wanted to be seen by each audience, okay? And he's reflecting on this skill at age 15. Um, Another uh, girl talking about wanting to write a complaint to, for her mother's mistreatment by a welfare um, uh, person. And she talked about how she wrote it because she wanted to write a good complaint. And she wanted it to sound like it came from a grown-up, but she didn't want to be rude herself. Okay, so this, this thoughtfulness in how they approach, how kids approach this task. It's not just moving words from here, from one language to another, never could be. So we've been thinking about, well, how can we apply this to school? How can we build on these uh, skills? And we've been talking with teachers and working in classrooms and generating, and basically using uh, translation as a generative construct to say, well, how can, there's many ways we could apply this, and I hope you'll all think with me today about how you might apply this in your classrooms. The spirit of this is work done by Carol Lee in, in cultural modeling to say um, we, can, we can build explicitly on the resources and skills that students um, from non-dominant groups in particular, but basically the skills that, stu that all of our students bring to the classroom. We can identify analogs between the ways the things kids do outside of school and the things we expect them to do in school. And as an example of that, Carol has worked with African American high school students looking at the everyday practice of signifying and drawn parallels with what I just bungled at the beginning of this talk, similes and metaphors, okay, the use of literary tropes in, in English instruction. And say kids are doing this all the time in everyday talk, and we can leverage that as a resource for doing the same kind of thing in the format of school. So we've been saying, how can we build on translating? How can we use this as a generative construct and help kids to think about all the ways they quote unquote translate across languages, registers, discourses. How do you say the same things? Paraphrasing, we always ask kids to do in school. How do, you, how do you say the same thing in different ways? And can you say it in exactly the same way? And in all of this, we're doing lots of talk about talk. And to start it off, we show the kids